6.33, and we're going to go through the newspapers now. Should we have a look at the front pages first? Yeah, let's do that. Telegraph, uh, leading on damaging allegations against Deputy Chief Tory Whip, as it is revealed that the PM turned a blind eye to sex pest warnings, it says. Yeah, the mirror leads on the Prime Minister's failings, they say, to crack down on Pincher despite those warnings. Times leads on the latest allegations that the Prince of Wales took money from foreign donors against the advice of his courtiers. The Observer covers the official probe into the Prime Minister's plan to build 40 new hospitals by 2030. Uh, the Express calls on the PM and Chancellor to reduce taxes ahead of the next general election. And the Star leads on warnings to cut back on washing <laughs> to save water. Says that given that we're all going to have a heat wave, we're all going to have to get hot and dirty. Right. That's something to look forward to, isn't it? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> uh, 6.34, should we go through what's inside them? Yes, indeed. And Marianne and Andre are with us. <laughs> You're looking forward to a summer of being hot and dirty. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with it, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, let's have a look at the, uh, the latest scandal on the front page of the Mail on Sunday, <laughs> Mary. Yeah, so this is... The fact that I'm sorry, I've got a cup of coffee. No oh, water. <laughs> All of a sudden. Um, so this is the fact that Boris Johnson apparently knew entirely about the allegations about and the, the reputation of this MP Chris Pincher two years ago, and during the meeting when they decided that he was going to get this job in senior government managing the behaviour of, of MPs, Boris Johnson apparently said, he's handsy, that's a problem, pincher by name, pincher by nature. Oh, no. And then, nonetheless, they agreed to give him the job. Lots of the other members of that same department said mm. that is not an acceptable yeah. um, appointment, threatened to resign, and all this is obviously now coming out uh, because Downing Street had previously said that Boris Johnson wasn't aware of any, any allegations and therefore... Boris Johnson, at least, is blameless in this situation. Mm. Um, not, in not. some of the other papers, there's more details about the allegations and then how it was dealt with by other members of the Tory party within the bar in the immediate aftermath. Yeah. Someone um, apparently saying to the guy who'd just been assaulted, oh, but aren't you gay? It's like, what has yeah. that got to do yeah. with it? Well, yeah. that's why I was asking a bit earlier. Yeah. Would this all have been dealt with much faster and, you know, no questions really about the way to deal with it if he had groped a woman, allegedly groped a woman? The fact that he allegedly groped a man may be not taken as seriously because somehow, you know, men are up for it. Oh, so what's wrong with that? And Yeah. I don't but, know. That's, do you that's, think it, it sort, of, sort of reveals a very <coughs> problematic... Approach that we as a society. He said that remark, and he, if you thought you were gay, so <coughs> that's all right too. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's what you people do. That, is yeah. the sort of implication, and that is appalling in its own right. It, but isn't that an element of all these sexual harassment cases? It's young men that really get the brunt of it. Now, I'm not saying that women in the House of Commons get treated well, but young men are completely left on their own. Now, look. You know, when I worked at the House of Commons, uh, and I'll tell you the nickname of Chris Pincher, now this is based on his... Oh, you're allowed to say that on air. No, you'll be able to, it's, it's all right. It's his, his constituency followed by his name. He was known as the Tamworth Pincher. Now, oh, I mean, I in reality, now, that is his constituency and his name, but what does that tell you about what people thought about his behaviour, that that was his nickname? Now, look, he's not a bad guy, but at the end of the day, if you're going to get very, very... Well, if you're going to get very, very drunk and behave inappropriately, then you can't be in that position of authority. But we've gone past any... Haven't we gone past anyway questioning his character? Because obviously these are still allegations. Uh, the only thing he has admitted to is getting ridiculously drunk. But I'm just saying, it's almost beyond now him and his character because they knew about it. It's whether the decisions that then consequently promoting him and everything else, it's yeah. whether that is the bigger problem. Yeah, it? the story is as much about Boris Johnson's judgment as it is about what he did. Exactly, and, and the culture within Westminster. Yes. Yes. You know, these elected members of our democracy who represent us appear to live by these rules that just do not apply or should not apply to the rest of us. We used to have some sense of... The, the role, the responsibility, the, the privilege of serving your community, that there were a certain very basic degree of standards that were expected of someone holding a public office. And the thing that really concerns me is that there's this shifting baseline 
where over the past few months, past couple of years perhaps, the things that we expect and that kind of just roll our eyes and go, oh, another one, mm. has meant that the, the basic standard that we expect from someone in public office is just well appalling. Well, that's... So we kind of go, oh, yeah, sexual assault, nah, well, that's... well, you know, public corruption, oh, yeah, yeah giving, yeah. giving a massive million-pound contracts to your mates, ah, oh, we're becoming desensitised to it in a way. Just very quickly, Andre, because we want to move on. Yeah, what I was going to say is, what I was going to say is, what, what, what you've just said is predicated on the assumption that there is more bad behaviour. What it could also be is more bad behaviour being exposed. So actually, this process might be a positive thing. But I'll tell you something. The, in reality, people get absolutely shedded in the office and drinking, you know, 10, 15 pints a day. I, I think the bars need to close in reality. I just don't think it's appropriate. I've not heard that phrase. <coughs> so that's interesting. Um, uh, uh, what's this on the front of the Telegraph? Um, the, the government's top lawyer blaming Remainers and Reserve. Oh, this is the sort of moan we actually want to be making, isn't it, about our, about our political leaders? Yeah, so Ella Braverman is complaining that... Uh, uh, a lot of civil servants just absolutely hate Brexit and are not willing to take the advantages of Brexit. They've, they've given a couple of examples. There's things like VAT is still in line with Europe, where the, actually we don't have to be in line with Europe. I think, for me, as an avowed Brexiteer, I've always felt that, whether you like Brexit or not, a lot of people within the civil service see it as a problem that needs to be managed rather than opportunity to be granted. But, but is it the civil service's problem if VAT, uh, you know... It, is that not the chance and the chance that yeah, the end? Well, I, 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 hey, 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 I, I hear you, brother. You know, I'm a, I'm a conservative. I don't exactly. see any conservative so, movements in this yeah, country. Yes, yeah, so, um, so there seems an odd thing for the attorney general to be blaming civil service yes. when it's just, the chancellor could just very easily cut me. I think, I think the, the other problem is, I think, she, I think you make a fair point. I think actually, in many respects, it's the parliamentarians that are to blame. The number of times that I heard. Or what we need to do is exceed the standards of Europe. No, we need to cut all this red tape out. So actually, you know, if you take Brexit and make uh, rules more onerous, then it will be hugely damaging. Let's move on to uh, lifting our eyebrows at the latest royal news, Marianne. Oh, yeah. You know, you thought that at least someone was... Well, no, they were not speaking clean, were they? Honourable, there's the word. Uh, so this is the news that um, the Charities Commission is looking into... Some, again, slightly murky behaviour, shall we say. I think we, I was on last week talking about mm. murky, murky uh, shenanigans with the royals and their charities and accepting money from Yes, whoever. because last, last week the story was about Prince Charles oh, accepting a suitcase full of money from, a, a, bag, a, from, from, from a, a, a Qatari sheikh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this one is that Prince Charles presented a person called Lord Brownlow uh, with an award um, uh, who had... This guy had already spent £1.7 million bailing out the Prince of Wales a sort of property development um, eco project for, to build a new eco village mm. that never really got built, that never really had the backing of the local community. Um, Prince Charles still owns property nearby, but kind of shuns the village. And this guy, Lord Brownlow, sort of bought up lots of the assets. Now, isn't Lord Brownlow the man who bought the wallpaper for yes, Boris's Yes, he bought the wallpaper. Bat. Apparently, he was on the list of people might be buying uh, Boris Johnson's kid uh, 150,000. Oh, that's right. He sounds pounds. like a man to seriously get to know because he always I mean, gives money away. Well, exactly, <laughs> that's it. I mean, and he's worth, apparently, he's worth 271 million. Right. So this is still pocket change. I just, yeah, yeah. I just wonder whether people just sit there going, well, who's going to pay for that? Get Brownlow. Brownlow, 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 Brownlow will do it. He's probably on speed dial somewhere, you know, isn't he? You know, exactly. I'm, I'm the thing is, he's also a trustee of the charity, and the question is, were these interests declared? And it, yeah. again, raises the question of all these people in influential, powerful decision making positions who appear to have absolutely terrible judgment of well, what looks right and what is right. Is there, uh, look, I'm going I'm to advance a controversial view here, but is there an argument for saying, look, a CBE is a lump of tin. If somebody's willing to give £2 million to charity, let's just send them the lump of tin. Well, I would agree with that, as long as it is to charity, to a proper yeah. charity, and not just to somebody's By big little project. Yeah. I don't know how much this eco-village, and this clearly no needs the investigation, the eco-village is a charity, apparently. Mm. But how, who's it a charity for? Who's it actually helping? Well, that's it. I, it, I mean, if it was £1.7 <laughs> million pounds that had been donated to cancer research, yes. you would actually say, all right, give the man an OBE, what do we care? But it just depends I think on Charles, 
I think the justification. I think there's a couple of elements to this story. Now, I might get the figures wrong here, but I remember Prince Charles buying Dumfries' house, and he and he and, they, and it was like 10, 20 million pounds he spent on it, and he just raised all the money by having fundraising dinners and palm pressing. Mm. And I have to say to you. Uh, instinctively, I'm quite keen on rigging the system so that millions of pounds gets brought in. But as you say, Anne, what you can't do is, oh, I've decided to build this village, let's pocket all the money. Mm. But to be fair, I don't think you see much evidence of Prince Charles doing any of this sort of thing for anything other than charitable causes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. GB Views at gbnews.uk for a feedback on that one. Uh, just finally, Andre, the age of cheap travel, air travel, is over. Yeah, I'm slightly, I'm slightly bemused by Michael O'Leary from Ryanair complaining that Air Force is too cheap. I, I, I thought that was his stick. But anyway, uh, I think they gave the example in the paper that um, if you were to go from, I think it's Liverpool Street to Stansted, return, it would be £40 on the train. If you were then to fly to Milan, it'd be £20 return. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, I've, I've got to be honest with you. I think Ryanair potentially have taken it too far. There was that terrible incident, wasn't there, of 120 people being stranded because Ryanair weren't willing to wait when people were in the security queue. I think when you get into £10 one way, £20, I think it might be worth just spending a bit more to get more pay for the pilots. I mean, 30,000 a year to be a pilot when it costs 150,000 pounds yeah. to train, and a lot of the staff don't get And treated. better pay for the baggage handlers and everybody else who matters when you're going abroad and you need a, tr a stress free uh, journey. Meanwhile, while he says that, the front page of the Sunday Times says that uh, EasyJet, the boss of EasyJet, is taking all his corporate, uh, his senior managers on a corporate jamboree in, to Mallorca. Um, and they're going obviously on a, a private the jet. They use, I know, jamboree. jamboree. Yeah, uh, but it's, it's, a weekend it, away. it's a weekend away for all his top people. Um, but they are going to stay uh, two nights at the five star Ibero Star Resort Hotel in Palma. Um, it's on the beach, it boasts a rooftop infinity pool and a sunset champagne bar. Quite fancy going. Uh, but I would have to queue, the rest of us would have to queue and maybe even sleep on the floor at Heathrow Airport to actually do the journey. These guys are going to presumably walk straight past the queues onto a private jet and just go away. Um, and it's not a good look, is it? Well, it's a, bit, it's a bit weird if you own an airline not using it. I mean, even if you, uh, I don't know, even if you, uh, you know, moved, put different seats in there, it was at least liveried as your own airline. And just yeah, but like I said, they're going to go through a VIP section of the airport, aren't they? They're not they? going to go through the same but, experience as their What is the point in us pretending we wouldn't go if we got invited? Oh, no, I would definitely. <laughs> I, think, yeah, it's not that, I, I think it's more the point that the, the way they're going to get there is not going to be the way yeah. that any of us are going to get to where we want to get. All right, and so we talk about the, the baggage handlers and the pilots not being particularly well paid at all, which may be what what's causing a problem now recruiting um, but for instance the uh, air, the ex top exec of uh, EasyJet uh, the chief exec John Johan Lundgren um, has a home on the island uh, they're going to he's paid a basic salary of 740 grand and a bonus of 1.5 million well you're paying me more than that to be here so yes I won't do I won't lie about it he's expecting his holiday tickets in the envelope afterwards as well yeah if you have got his infinity pool sorted he'll twist it so I still want to hear from anyone at home who's like rethinking as I am having to do and it's breaking my heart because I do love my holidays I've got to an age where I didn't used to but I've got to an age now where I really want a holiday to look forward to but has it made you think twice or maybe you just think I'm going to stick to a staycation this year yeah don't get me started on baggage no I mean he's he has yet to be reunited bag, with his still at the bag. Uh, I heard the bag texted me last night. It's still in Munich. Mm. It's been there a week. Having a good, having time. A good time, apparently. So <laughs> one day I'll see it. Yeah. So you packed, yeah, you yeah. packed your case, got there, and never ever saw your suitcase. The bag never left Heathrow, and then uh, the day after I got back from Munich, it, I then got told it's flying out to Munich. Oh, that's good. So, so we you crossed it go up. past. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and then, of course, you can't call the airline because they don't have a phone line. Because well, they don't have any human beings. You can't, they tell you to go online and talk to an autobot and then and, uh, email an automated system. And so I haven't actually spoken to anyone about the bag unless I physically go to... Heathrow Airport to and sort of Auto oh, Munich, yeah, now, yeah. Quite, quite often it becomes circular, doesn't it, where the cops <laughs> don't understand you, they just return you to the beginning and you go, please, can it, I talk to a person? That's the worst yeah. thing about it. That's the worst thing about yes. it. There's no one to call. No, no one to no, speak the to. worst thing, it'll, be, it'll get worse, I can imagine. It'll start sending you postcards. <laughs> <laughs> Love from wherever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Hi, Sally. <laughs> Having a great time. Yeah. How, how are you doing with your lack of clothes? Yes, you just have to go out and buy a new suit. Well, yeah, I have already. This is, yeah. this is market econ economics for you. Yes, yeah. yes, it's wonderful. Don't it's open that can of worms. Well, well, this is what you, you might have avoided. Right? And but, yeah. now you're reaping the seeds. Oh, I love yeah. the ten, 10 quid flights. Who cares about your bag? Buy, buy some new underwear when you get them. Exactly. With, with the money you save, yeah. spend it on the clothes. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> That's the news. Don't travel with your clothes. Buy them when you're exactly. there. It's good for the local economy. Right, enough um, of that.